All right, we got some more people getting on. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Those of you online, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Hopefully you can hear me. We got a lot of talk going on in the room here. Uh, so let me see if we can hear you. So somebody online want to say good morning so we can see we hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see you all. Good morning. So it's about time. So I'm going to call us to order here if I can. We got a talkative group this morning here in the room. Uh, it's a little chilly in here. The summit feels good. Okay. Well, so we, uh, for those of you in the room, um, I can't, uh, the, the air conditioning is all operated by a computer that I can't get into to change the temperature. So we're stuck with it for, for now. If it's too cold for you, I'll go get you a little shawl to put on to keep you warm. Anybody need one? Yep. Exactly. We'll go grab some prayer shawls and put it wrap you up and no. Okay, there you go. Between us, we got it covered. Does anybody need anything to keep warm? Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get started now. <laughs> Let's get started now. It's good to see all of you. Welcome to those of you who are online with us. And uh, now as I get the, the folks to settle down in here, can you hear okay online? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yes. yes. Um, and can we hear you okay? Let's try that again. Somebody say hi. 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 Okay. Hi. Hello. Um, I wonder if I can, I wonder if I could turn them up a little bit. I don't know if I can or not. We're going to, hopefully I don't mess things up here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, good. I figured it out. Yeah, that'd be a lot better. All right. There we go. So I think we'll be able to hear each other better now. And um, just a reminder for those in the room, um, um, we get very engaged and we're ready to kind of jump in and talk. But, but unless Vaughn's holding the mic for you, the people online don't hear. So we want to make certain we got the mic close to us so that everybody's able to participate well. Um, and uh, with that, um, today we are concluding our study of the, the letter First John. Um, and um, I'll share with you my thoughts about what follows uh, after First John when we get to the end of the class. But for today, I'm excited for us to, to complete this study. Uh, it's been a it's been a good and interesting one for me, uh, but a challenging one too. It has not been an easy letter to to read, so it's been a little challenging. But we're going to persevere and we're going to finish her up. So let's begin with uh, with prayer, okay? Loving God, we are grateful for the blessings of this day. We're so so grateful uh, to be able to be with one another in this way. Um, and I give you thanks for um, the opportunity for us to to share in our faith uh, and um, to be about this Bible study. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds to your presence with us as we go about this study. And that we'll be ever aware of your presence, for you are the reason we gather. Uh, we ask uh, special blessings uh, upon our families and our loved ones. Uh, you watch over and protect them and, and for our church as well. Uh, but now as we go about this study, we just give you thanks for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So just going to give a little bit of review as we get started with the study. Okay. Um, and... Um, 
So by now, for those of you who've been going through all the weeks of the study, it's become pretty clear that John is addressing a struggling congregation. Um, and um, the language that I'll use to talk about what happened in the church was there was a split. There was a group of people who left. And, and for those who remained, they needed to know some things. Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar, yeah. For those who remained, they, there are some things they needed to know. Uh, they needed some reassuring that they were going to be okay, right? Because things had changed so dramatically. Um, they needed to know that that they were right, right? Um, and they needed to know, be kind of reaffirm what it really means to be a Christian. Um, and they needed some help making sense out of what had happened uh, and what the deal was with those who had left. So in response, John uh, addresses these things. Um, he lets the people know that those who left were not Christians. Um, and they were not Christians evidenced by the way they behaved and what they believed. Okay? So, so those who left, you know, he says they were really never one of, part of us, right? So they were not Christians evidenced by how they behaved, uh, and what they believed. He then says, and, and to be a Christian, this is a reminder to everybody what being a Christian is really all about. He says to, to be a Christian is to believe in Jesus, right? To believe in, in Jesus, fully human, fully divine. So that's an important part of it, is believing in Jesus, fully human and fully divine. Um, and that a true belief always is honest with oneself, um, so it leads to confession. Uh, and a true belief always wants to participate in, in uh, the life of Jesus, uh, which means living a life of love. So if somebody truly believes, they're going to believe that Jesus is um, uh, uh, fully human, fully divine. They're going to be honest about their own need for him in their life. Uh, and they're going to seek to try to live a life of love. That's what he's trying to tell them. Okay. He wants them to know that what they need to focus on is not those who left. They need to focus on growing up themselves. Because right? they're all little children. Remember, he says that over and over and over again. They're all little children. Um, so keep practicing love. Keep learning how to love. Because the day will come when you'll be perfected in that love and you'll have a full assurance uh, of the truth of all that uh, he's been telling them. So he's trying to help these folks um, feel secure in their faith, help them to grow up in their faith while making sense out of what had happened uh, that led to some folks who were leaving. And he reminds them that as they are seeking to to live a life of faith by loving one another, that they don't have to do that alone, that they have the gift of the Holy Spirit to help them with it. So, so that kind of gives us a little summary of where we have been up to now. Hi, Karen. Hi, Brent. Good to see you. Welcome. So we are going to finish 1 John now uh, with by picking up with chapter 4. Uh, and we left off uh, at verse 17, but we'll back up and read verses 13 uh, through 21 um, to, to get us going for today. As we prepare, I want to remind you that, that John's writing, the point he's trying to make, is not a linear argument. He doesn't go from A to B to C to D, like Paul often does. His is very circular. So he keeps circling back over the same stuff over and over and over again. Okay. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, my mother saying, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, right? And, and it kind of feels like that, what John's saying, because he tells us like a thousand times the same thing. It's kind of this circular thing. So when it really comes down to it, as complicated as it is to read, and to follow, 
there's it's it's a pretty simple message um, that he just keeps telling us over and over and over again. Um, so with that, we will hear some themes that we have been hearing throughout the letter uh, as we move forward. But there's also a few new things that are going to kind of emerge uh, as we move into the end of the letter. Okay, so questions or comments before we start reading? Any online? Okay. So let's jump in then. First John chapter 4, 13 through 21. Um, and we need somebody who's willing to read that for us. I'll look online first. Is there anybody online who wants to read? No pressure. I can, I can read. Okay, thanks, Keeney. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Jeannie. Okay. So we hear that same theme repeat itself over and over again of the importance of loving one another. Um, and um, uh, and for those who do not love their neighbor, then they do not love God. We've heard that many times, right? Um, and we've had some conversations around how difficult that is. Um, so... Um, Thoughts or comments before I ask you some questions? Okay, you're ready to go, huh? Okay. So we have, we have this um, uh, kind of beautiful section uh, of the letter uh, where, we, where John is telling us um, that we abide in, in Christ and Christ abides in us, right? Um, and... Uh, and how does that happen? By believing in Jesus, that, that we then abide in him and he abides in us. Um, and, um, and he reminds us then that this whole thing is about love, right? God is love. Those who abide in God are abiding in love. Right? Um, and that love is perfected among us in this way, he says. And this is... Um, Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, that's kind of a challenging thought right there. Okay, so first, what's the day of judgment? Death. Death? Okay, death. Anybody want to? Add to that, Christ's return, end times, anybody else? Do you get a picture in your mind when you think of the day of judgment? Asteroids. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Okay. Bright, shiny lights. What was that, Jim? Bright, shiny lights. Bright, shiny lights. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a picture in their mind? 
I, I, I always have this picture of standing before the Lord. It comes from the Ma- Gospel of Matthew. Um, in fact, I'm preaching on this particular passage this next Sunday. Um, but uh, standing where the, you know, separating the sheep from the goats. Um, uh, a day of, of judgment where we can present ourselves to the Lord. Um, so if we picture ourselves standing before the Lord, what does it mean to be able to stand with boldness or confidence? Yeah. Believing that we're going to be with him. Yeah. Brent. So, um, I would say believing also, you said believing earlier, Mm -hmm. but, um, he makes the point here that. Um, those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters. So you could give, I think, uh, intellect. You tell me if this if this makes sense. You could give kind of assent to, oh, I believe in God, right? You could say it with your words, but not really mean it, mm-hmm. right? And and it seems to me it's relational, like you remind us, right? Mm-hmm. It's you have to actually love. It has to be followed up in action. Is that? Mm-hmm. It can't just be, oh, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Because mm-hmm. right. you could say that with your mouth and not believe it with your heart. Right. Yeah. And and that has been a theme that we've seen pop up in the letter where um, Matthew says it a little bit clearer, I think. Not everybody who cries, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. And that's from Matthew chapter 7. Um but but it's that theme keeps popping up of of you know to truly believe it really means something in your heart, right? Uh, and to love really means something. Yeah, Karen. Oh, I'm thinking, um, um, to be bold on that day of judgment is secure and in, in your relationship with God. You have walked with God. You 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 have a relationship, and I think that encourage me encourages me when i read mm-hmm. this about the boldness mm-hmm. because it's not like i'm just going before god that i haven't that i don't have a relationship with mm-hmm. yeah that makes sense absolutely it's that sense of security in your in your relationship so you're confident you already know when you stand there you already know you're loved you already know you're accepted so there is nothing to fear. And when, and, yes. And you've done your best. When you've done your best, okay. You know that you're loved, but you also know the boldness, I agree with you, means that you have done the best. Not to say that you haven't made mistakes, mm-hmm. but you have tried. Yeah, have tried and done your best. Um, and when, when we hear about um, Christian perfection, um, and and I'm going to do this kind of from a Wesleyan perspective because John Wesley really focuses on this, and it really comes from this letter, First John. Um, Christian perfection um, um, has to do with um, us um, being our lives being completely defined by that love, um, and it leads us to to being prepared then to stand before the Lord with that sense of complete security that we 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 have that blessed assurance jesus is mine we know we abide in him he abides in us we know everything is fine right and so that's a day of great celebration and there's nothing then to fear but if we've lived our lives saying i believe in jesus but i hate that guy down the road right Uh, and we really haven't embodied this belief we could very well find ourselves standing there a little bit frightened and maybe for for a good reason. Okay. Why is that a good reason? Maybe I don't like Bob because he walked off with my $85 copay. Am I supposed to love Bob with the perfect love God gave me? It, it, is, it is freeing to love somebody who's hurt you. And it is life-taking can I have my to be angry at somebody back? who hurt you. <laughs> so, so you have to decide what your life's going to stand for. Do you, do you like to hold on to the bitterness or do you want to be freed from it? I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. <laughs> you want your $85. Yeah. I love Bob. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then you love them. If you, so you want so justice is more important to you than love. So I have a question about that. Um, yeah. What if okay. it's happening now? Okay. Like, so you know, let's hold on a second. Like, so Janie, we can't hear you. Go ahead and start again now. So I said, uh, my question about that is, if somebody is hurting you now, mm -hmm. it's like in the present. It's not in the past. How do you forgive them now? How do you forgive their behavior if they're continually doing it? Well, so... I mean, that's a that's a big question. It's a very important question, too. OK, are you going to help us with this, Jane? Um, I went uh, to a session and had a Franciscan monk there, which I, always bothered me, this love your enemies. Mm -hmm. I thought, how can you know, that's hard to do. And he was really clear. He said, if you have hold this in your heart, you know what it does to you. We've all felt that way. The stress, the agony. And as you said, you have to free it. Mm -hmm. And that made me realize that is the reason he's thinking about us again. Mm -hmm. He wants us to have an open spirit and welcome a hand that could block things. And, mm -hmm. and it made it much more understandable <laughs> to me why that was love your enemies yeah it's it's for us to release that hate. very good thank you thank you thank can you, you love putin <laughs> okay okay so so let me go back to Jeannie's question though which yeah trying to rein in so the the question is but what if somebody's hurting you now which is kind of related right and how do you forgive that person now and uh and uh, one of the things that's important to recognize is if somebody is hurting you, it's fine to make certain you're safe, right? Yeah. So you don't have to stay in a sp spot where you continue to be hurt. We got room for you, Joe. Come on in. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> so so it, it helps to remember when it comes to forgiveness um that we don't have to stay in a situation where we're being hurt it's very difficult to forgive somebody who's continually hurting you right so it's okay to be to make certain that you have a sense of safety um, we often confuse forgiveness and reconciliation. We think of the two as kind of going uh, as the same thing. And reconciliation uh, is different than forgiveness, right? Reconciliation requires, you know, all parties to get together and figure out what their life's going to be now moving forward. Whereas forgiveness is something that a person can do independent of another person. Um, I can forgive somebody who hurt me who's now dead, Right. So I don't need that person to be here in order to forgive the person. I would need that person to be here and to be willing in order to reconcile with them. But to forgive the person, I can do that independent of, of their involvement even in it. Because to forgive somebody is to say, I'm not going to let you keep hurting me. Right? Uh, I, I'm not going to allow this thing that you've done to define me and my life and how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to release that. Forgiveness is not a feeling. If we wait to feel like we want to forgive somebody, we might wait a long time. It's a decision we make about what our life's going to stand for and, and what we want to have impact upon our lives. Um, so this kind of understanding it can, can help. Um, but I will say this. It, um, the, there, I, there are good Christians who are quick to forgive, and there are good Christians who are slower to forgive. And you don't need to beat yourself up over which one you are, right? Um, and um, I, I'm quick to forgive. But if somebody's hurting me now, the next minute I'm not going to forgive the person. It's still going to take me a little while to decide, okay, I don't want to keep replaying this thing that happened in my head anymore. I don't want to keep feeling this way anymore or allow what this person did to make me feel this way. There comes a point where I say, okay, so I'm going to forgive so I can move on. Um, 
And um, so I don't know if that helps a little bit. There's no easy answer to the question, though, Jeannie. Yeah, I thank you so much. I mean, I feel like if I was to, um, uh, you know, um, sort of simplify it, it's almost like you uh, first you remove yourself from the situation, the harmful situation. And secondly, is you accept what has happened or is happening to you and you let go. Uh, something along those lines. Um, it helps. It helps somewhat. I think um, it's definitely not an easy thing. I think it's a very personal thing. It depends on your relationship with that other person. Your, you know, the uh, the other people who are involved in the in the situation. But uh -huh. um, yeah, that that it helps. It helps. Thank you. Sure, sure. Brent, were you going to say something? I I just uh, a lot of us know of a guy who who hung on a cross and said forgive them for they know not what they do yeah right he was being hurt right in that there. very moment yeah in that very moment yeah. yeah yeah and we're striving to be like him it's hard to forgive if you're being hurt I mean being hurt now right if the person is hurting you in the now mm -hmm. continue or how do you forgive somebody unless it stops well, like Brent said, Jesus did. And I think you, as you mentioned, there's there's a freedom. There's an mm -hmm. incredible freedom. Yes. Not that we can all do it. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah. And so you don't have to, we don't have to beat ourselves up over, you know what, I, I within 24 hours, I can let this go versus within six months, I can let this go. But it's helpful to remember as long as we're holding on to it, it's a burden. Yes. It's a burden as long as we're holding on to it. And and forgiveness is what frees the burden. Okay, so yeah. Now, that just reminds me, this was years ago, 30, 35. I remember I was teaching Sunday school at the time, and the phrase let go, let God mm -hmm. was just I remember we had the buttons and kids mm -hmm. had the shirt. I mean, it was just, I don't know, it just seemed to be everywhere. And I'd say it, I was the Sunday school teacher. And it didn't mean what it means to me now, mm -hmm. especially after you know hearing these conversations and what it meant to me then mm -hmm. is not the same. Yeah. You know, it was like, okay, let go, let God. It's like, oh, maybe sometimes, <laughs> you know, I will or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now it has a whole different because just as everybody said, it's yeah. just yeah, it's just yeah. freeing. It's just because yeah, so there, there's so many other things to worry about and to deal with or whatever. And it's yeah. just like when you do that, it you know. Okay honestly do it it's just mm -hmm. yep oh, yeah yeah louise and then we'll come over to phil okay there's a bridge and the bridge is praying for that person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's tough to do let me tell you yeah yeah it's tough to pray for that person and and i said a prayer this morning and i said oh and please include so and so and her family and well, what's his name that was with her at the time? That, that SOB. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I moved on, but it is the bridge. Yeah. Between. Well, and we hear that you know, we hear that within this within the scriptures. Um, you know, love your pray for those who want to harm you. Um. And we see Jesus do that as well, you know, because it's a prayer. Father, forgive them. So, um, yeah, that's an important part. I mean, we could do a whole class on forgiveness. Uh, I've preached like a three or four part series on forgiveness. There's a lot to talk about there um, in it. Um, and, you know, it helps to, to humanize the person, right? When it comes to forgiveness, um, you know, it, you know, if, 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 somebody hurt me well that person has a story right? right they have a life and there's something going on in their own lives and to be able to <clears throat> to re remember that humanizing the person who hurt us helps a whole lot too to be willing to then forgive the person and really that becomes the essential part in being able to ever reconcile so back to the question of putin <laughs> <laughs> okay now we got to go to phil back to the question of putin no, so so I, I want to get us back to the scripture here in a minute, okay? But back to the question of, of, 
of Putin. Um, well, classes, do you believe there is pure evil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe but it is. Oh, there you yep. go. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I pray for him every day to find the love. Yeah, so you pray for him every day to find love. Okay, good. Phil, let's give Phil a chance here if you can. Oh, you got it. Let's wait for the mic, though, because I know it's going to be really good. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay. Speaking from my own self, we all know this forgiveness and hurting and everything what we need to do but to me it's my choice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with god's help i have lord help me and i also need to remember that god created them and they're not perfect as well as i am i'm not yeah. perfect i might be doing the same thing that they're doing but i'm you know i'm always right but you know that I have to I have to humble myself before God because yeah. I remember him saying, Leave it to me. I am the true judge. Mm -hmm. And it's not for me to judge that person. It's my responsibility is to let go of this. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And it's my choice. If I want to unload this burden on my heart and my mind, mm -hmm. then I have to make a choice and leave it to God. Let yep. go, let yeah. God. So, so bringing this back around to to First John and 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 are Christians to love people like Putin? Well, the answer is yes. Okay. So everybody got it. We done with the class. <laughs> okay. So here, but here's the reality of it, right? And and John sounds so. So, um, you know, there's no gray in life. It's either this or it's that. So if you love God, you love others, period. And if you hate other people, you don't love God, right? And, um, and, and but then there are other times in John where he says, my little children, and I know you're not perfect, right? Um, and so he's trying to help people grow toward being perfected in love but we're not there yet and so we find these things very difficult and maybe we're even unable to do that 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 just reminds us not that we're human but that we're that the god still isn't finished perfecting us in love you're under uh, still under construction yeah. still under construction we still got we still got some growing up to do um, and, and the fact that we have growing up to do doesn't change the fact that we are, um, already abiding in Christ. It just shows that we are not yet fully grown up, mature in Christ, haven't reached the full stature of Christ in Paul's words. In these, in John's words, we haven't been perfected in love yet. And we don't have to hate the person. We can hate the behavior. Mm -hmm. We don't love what they do. Hate yeah. what they do. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, that's great. Cool. Uh, I, I think we tend. Oh, hold on one second, Dave. Let's get for the mic here, because I know this is going to be good too. <laughs> Go on. Um, I just I think part of part of the problem, maybe at least for me, I would say, is I tend to think about love as as uh, being nice. Right. When a lot of times love takes a, a role like tough love, mm -hmm. like for our children, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem nice to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I think it's it's not about being nice to Putin when we say we love him. Mm -hmm. Right. It might mean we need he needs some tough love. It might mean he needs to be held accountable for right. his actions. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Exactly. And that's loving. Mm -hmm. And that's loving. So I, I just think. Love gets uh, sorry, Bonnie. <laughs> you thought I was done. <laughs> that is that. <laughs> I think love gets sort of uh, messed up in popular culture. Yeah, and and if I read a picture or not, I think of a scripture that kind of goes along with that. And I I quoted it uh, during my son sermon on Sunday, the sevenfold indictment of Jesus against that group of religious leaders who are out to get him. You know, and, and he says, you know, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
Um, some very strong words. Does that mean he didn't love them? Does it, did he hate them? No, this, that was a convicting grace moment for them to try to get them to really look at their lives he, uh, in order for maybe a way to break through when everything else he had done hadn't broken through to them. And the thing that I think people most miss, whether it's their marital life or whatever, is knowing how to give tough love, knowing how to have tough conversations with people, knowing mm -hmm. what to say to people. You kind of know what they should know, but you're afraid to say it or you're afraid mm -hmm. to do it. I think we're missing a whole dimension of love mm -hmm. a lot of times in our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to Jan here. Okay. Probably off the subject, but I often wonder who I have hurt that I am not aware of. Mm -hmm. So I have a prayer that what I said or did, may I be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I want to be Jan when I grow up. Yeah. That was good. That was good. I love that. That's really good. Thank you. Thank you. A good reminder, too. Good reminder for all of us, because because, you know, part of not being perfected in love yet includes. And what did I do that could have hurt somebody else that I may not even be aware of? So good. Good. Wesley, let's get let's get Vaughn over here for a second. Vaughn's getting his steps in today. And then I'm going to then I'm going to pause for a minute. We're going to check in online. Go ahead. The most profound part of this to me is that when this sadness and despising another person for something they've done to you is to be able to forgive them and let it go uh -huh. and it helps you uh -huh. and I spent 20 years uh -huh. despising somebody not because they hurt me but they hurt my children uh -huh. and that's the most difficult thing yeah. but but it was still a relief uh -huh. it's like something being lifted off of me when I said, God yeah. help me. And that's what I pray for. I pray that I would be able to forgive that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Okay. So online, you all, it's been kind of wild in the room here a little. Y'all got anything you wanted to bring up or add to it? Okay. Well, let me, let me move us along now with the letter. Cause we are finishing it today. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. So this all started with us standing before the Lord for that for that judgment. And we can stand with this confidence, with boldness, because we know we abide in, in him and he abides in us. Um, and so there is nothing to fear. Um, and when we hear this perfect love casts out all fear, a great verse and, and one that pops up in my sermons sometimes. What's being spoken of here, though, is very specific. It's really talking about we can stand before the Lord. And we will have no reason to fear. And why? Because that perfect love is dwelling in us. We abide in that perfect love. So there is absolutely no reason for us uh, to be afraid. Okay. And, and, and then it does say here, and this is kind of him raising the bar really high. Um, uh, where did it go? Oh, yeah. Um, verse 17. Um that we can be emboldened in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Okay? That's kind of demanding, isn't it? We're supposed to be like him in this world? Okay? Remember, in the Gospel of John, um, the way it begins where it was in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things came into being through the word. And, uh, and then it goes on to say, what was coming into the world was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness cannot overcome it. And in the letter here, um, there's kind of this dualism. So I talked about this last week where he, he talks about the world and by world, he means a place of sin and darkness and then he talks about life abiding in Jesus. And life abiding in Jesus, Jesus is all about holiness 
and love, let me go back. Darkness is kind of the image for the world, but the description is death and sin. Um, light is a description for life in Christ, um, or an image for it. Um, and the description is holiness and love. Okay? So if we're abiding in Christ, then our life is all about holiness and love. And that's a light that shines in this world. The darkness of the world, the brokenness, the sin, the death, it can't overcome light. Our light will overcome. So we will be like him. We will be like light in the midst of this world. Are we perfect yet? Not yet. Are we on the way to that perfection? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So other questions or comments before we move on? See what else he has to say? Okay. So, um, so let's move on to chapter five now. Um, and um, so chapter five, uh, verses one through five, we hear that image of <clears throat> being born again that comes up. Uh, remember, that's an image that's rooted in the Gospel of John, the third chapter. Somebody want to read chapter five, one through five? Linda's going to do that for us? Yes. Okay. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay. Questions, comments? I love how this starts out because he does kind of a reversal here. Okay, I don't know if you noticed that, kind of a reversal. Because up to now, he said, those who love God love others. Right? Um. Um, but here he says, this we will know, uh, by this we will know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. By this we will know that we love the children of God, that we love God and obey his commandments. What's, what does that mean? You got something, Brent? You look like you do. I'm hoping you do. It's all raising my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your eyebrows go up. Ah. <laughs> Freud. Freud. I hate Freud. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Love your enemy. <laughs> yes. Freud is an exception. <laughs> Freud, you don't love. Uh, I mean, the reversal I thought you might have been referring to, so I may have you wrong, uh, is the is the last part of the previous verse for me. Uh, love the parent. Anyone who loves the parent should love the child. And then by this, we know that we love the children. By this, we know that we love the children of God. Mm -hmm. So... You you can't have uh, it partially, mm -hmm. right? You, if you love God the Father, you should love God's children, mm -hmm. just like the Great Commandment. Mm -hmm. right? That's the way I took it. Right, right, and and that you cannot separate these things, um, which is how the Great Commandments presented as well. You can't separate loving God and loving others. They are two sides of the same coin. So when Jesus gives a great commandment, he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and it's easy for us as Christians to want to think hierarchically. You know, so what's most important is we love God first. And then we love our family second. And then we love our neighbors third. And, you know, and then we get down to Freud or whatever. Uh, but no, we don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> but 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 it but it isn't hierarchical right um what we what we find is that loving god actually raises everybody else up to greater importance in our lives right and so and so when we love god we we're going to love each other in that same kind of way you know i can see the image of god in you why wouldn't i love you in that same kind of way then as i love god so you can't separate these two things that's scary huh <laughs> yeah so so yeah um yeah the image of god the spirit of this of this group mm-hmm. is the image of god mm-hmm. amen phil i'm trying to understand this is it is it right to say god created us all right we are all children of god but not all of us are perfect some just like a regular family a family of 10 Five might be real perfect, and the other right. are kind of, you know, that needs some work. So, is that like the way we should look at it and help them grow? Yeah, yeah. Like and what's really going to be important as we move forward in, in this is it's becoming going to become clearer and clearer that what he's talking about right now is the body of Christ. What he's talking about now are the are, are the people in the church. He's not really addressing people outside. He's talking to us, right? Um, and and that that kind of helps. When I was thinking about the reversal, here's what I've heard. Um, instead of, this is how we know we love God, by loving others, we hear, this is how we know we love others, by loving God. Okay? Both of those things are true because you can't separate the two. My footnote says we are one of God for God. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, that's by doing works, by loving one another and caring for one another. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I, I love this uh, statement here um, at, at the end of verse three. Uh, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. Okay. We've heard that a hundred times. And his commandments are not burdensome. Except we've already had this big conversation around what a burden it is, right? To have to love your enemy or to forgive somebody who's hurting you. Um, And to say that his commandments are not burdensome is a reminder that when we follow his commandments, it's very, very freeing, right? So we don't carry that weight with us that otherwise we might choose to carry with us. But by, but by loving as he instructs us to love, it becomes very freedom, freeing. There is no burden in it. Make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's empowering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if, if, if I love someone, if I forgive someone, I'm empowered to, to do that more often. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've found that the more I practice it, the easier it gets because it because it it becomes obvious to you what a burden it is and do you really want to carry it no okay phil i feel that we god nudges us i'm sure it's the holy spirit that he puts somebody along our way to really say this is your work phil you know love love this guy you feel like if, he's, if he's one of the family oh he's one of god's creation what reminds me what kind of helped me is god loves him he god created him and i feel that i'm being called by god to sh- be an instrument to show love and hoping that that person will i will be a part of growing him mm-hmm. in faith Amen. Makes sense. Amen. Now I want to be you as well when I grow up. That's real good. That's real good. These <laughs> people, those even though they don't believe the same way we do, those are still people we have to love. Well, so that's going to become interesting, and I think we'll get the answer to that question as we go a little further into this chapter. Okay, because he says some very harsh things about them at the end. 
Yeah. And it makes you wonder, wasn't he talking about love this whole time? Okay. So, so let's hang on to that and have some more conversation about it. Okay. So, so um, we hear here at the end um, about our victory um, for whatever, for whatever is born of God. So whoever um, is born of God conquers the world. That's that image of light shining in the darkness, right? It's, it's not supposed to be, you know, we're on this conquest, but it's just a re- recognition that uh, love always overcomes uh, sin or hatred. Um, and this victory that conquers the world comes about is our faith, right? It's our faith in Christ that, that results us, you know, us abiding in him and that light then shines uh, through us. Um, whoever it is that conquers the world, oh, no, who is it that conquers the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the son of God, right? So that belief in Jesus makes us more than conquerors. That light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it. I just had a personal connection to that. I guess in kind of a trivial sense. I mean, I had, I had to do something that was really causing me some anxiety. And had to do with family. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was through prayer. And I so appreciate uh, Louise talking about prayer. It was through prayer that I just found myself relaxing mm-hmm. and becoming at peace. We've all experienced this, I bet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I was able to enjoy, you know, whereas before I would have been, you know, stressed out about mm-hmm. it and stuff. I think that's uh, victory. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm going to hold on to that because, because. We have a big family, so I'm always having something hard to do. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> That's the truth. Yep, yep. Jim's a part of that family. Talk about hard. <laughs> I have to be careful. Yeah, no, no. Jim's great. Jim's great. <laughs> but he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yep. Okay, let's move on to chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. 6 through 13. Somebody want to read that for us? Is there anybody online who'd want to read it? All right, anybody in the room who'd like to read it? I can read it. I think we got, I, I think we got, Tim is going to read it here. So we got it. Thank okay. you, Jeannie. We got Tim. Go ahead. Oh, but wait for Vaughn to get to you. 6 through 13. Six through 13. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the spirit is the one that testifies, for the spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the, so without thinking about the, the first half of that, which is kind of complicated, that very ending, um, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of, of the son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Doesn't it feel like you're supposed to say amen there? Right. <laughs> it's like, that feels like the end of the letter. It it just feels like the end of the letter. And when you compare it to what is the end of the letter, verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Verse 13 feels like a lot better ending, right? Feels like a lot better ending. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, amen. That's why he wrote it to us. So that we can be 
confirmed in that faith. And we don't have to stand with fear before the Lord. And we know that even though we're little children, we're being perfected in love. And he wrote these things for us uh, to help us along that journey. But before that, we hear all this water and blood talk. Okay? Isn't that kind of strange, that water and blood talk? Explain it. <laughs> it is kind of weird. So we go back up to verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Came by water and blood, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. Okay? What's he trying to say there? Christ's death. Right, baptism and Christ's death. Okay? And why is that important for him to help people remember his baptism and Jesus' death? The Holy Spirit coming and that we will have eternal life because up until Jesus appeared, that was not the belief. Okay, that and who are, who are the people who just left the church? Oh. They did not believe Jesus was, was mortal. Was mortal. They didn't believe he was mortal. He didn't have blood. He was God. He didn't die on the cross. He was God, right? Um, and so he's saying that there are three things that testify to the truth of, uh, of what he, John, is saying. Jesus' baptism, his death on the cross, and the Holy Spirit who's confirming it. Right. And then he says, but now if you have a human being who gives a testimony, and that would be the people who were talking about Jesus being only God, which do you think is more credible? The human being's testimony or God's? Right? God's testimony is. Um, and that testimony is water, blood, confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Thoughts, questions, comments? Now, he also says, um, there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. So how does the water and the blood testify to the truth of Jesus Christ? That's a harder one, huh? John said he um, had the baptism. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, resurrection is death. Okay. And then the spirit, I, I don't know that. Oh, so I, I think the presence of the Holy Spirit confirming that um, for Christians, I think, is the more obvious answer. Right? When I think of the water and the blood testifying, think of worship. Think of the communion elements on the table. That's why the Catholics are so strong about it, isn't it? The Eucharist. One of the reasons why, yeah. 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 But so, so um, we hear that you know, Paul says every time we share this feast, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. So communion itself testifies to, to the death uh, of Jesus. Uh, and so, so and, then, and then baptism. Um, baptism itself testifies. Um, if we think about, and, and it's, again, it's Paul who talks in this way, of the water representing dying. So you go down into the water, you die to an old way. You rise out of the water, you rise to newness of life. And that water then testifies to the truth of what God has done. Right? So you got these images of water and blood. These are worship images that, that all have symbolic meaning for us. They testify to something that the Spirit then confirms this to be true uh, for us in our lives. That makes what, sense? What about the body of Christ? So, like, when you think about, when I think about communion, it's the bread and the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, what about 
Why isn't there mention of the body testifying? That's a good question. I think I'd I'd like to ask John that because <laughs> it because it, it seems like you could just as easily do that, huh? Yep. Yeah, it does. But what he says here is they got these three: the water, the blood, and um, I suspect that for the people he was speaking to, the the symbolism there uh, would have been a little bit easier for them to grasp. So it would have made more immediate sense to them. Be my guess. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Vaughn. The church is the body. Put your mic up. Put your mic up, Vaughn. The church is the body of Christ. <laughs> the church is the body of Christ. Yeah, the church is the body of Christ. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so let's let's press on. Okay. So if we remember verses 12 and 13, which sounds like an ending, um, verse 12, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Okay. And we, that reminds us of the gospel of John, where um, what was coming into the world was life and the life was the light of the world. And if we abide in him, then we have that life. But if we're not abiding in him, we do not have that life. That's been kind of a constant message of, of the letter. And then he says, and I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, who believe in Jesus, so that you may know you already have eternal life. Right? So it's very reassuring to a church that has been in some turmoil over the, 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 the split that took place. Um, and all the questions that left for the people who remained, um, you know, what happened and, and um, you know, are we right? And all the things that might have gone through their mind, just very, very reassuring. Um, and then he goes on to, to what seems like a series of statements that don't seem so connected, um, but they end up being connected after all. So let's read um, the end. We're going to first read, Verses, uh, um, let's see, where did, I'm sorry, just lost my train of thought here. We're on 14. Um, so let's read uh, verses 14 and 15. Somebody want to read 14 and 15 for us? Okay, Linda, we'll go ahead and do that. Oh, let's wait for this. We'll come back to you next. Okay. And we are sure of this, that he will listen to us whenever we ask him for anything in line with his will. And if we really know he is listening when we talk to him and make our requests, then we can be sure that he will answer us. Okay. Now, we've heard this in other letters and other teachings from the New Testament. This kind of idea um, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, then we know we have obtained the requests made of him. Okay, how do you make sense out of that? Ask and it shall be given. It doesn't always happen that way, right? Doesn't always happen that we ask and it'll be given. Is it according to his will? According to his will is is a is an important phrase in all of that, isn't it? It's an important phrase. If we're abiding in him, then uh, then at our best we're praying uh, according to that to his will because we abide in him, right? Okay. So well, uh, also we have to pursue him we can't just sit idly by and he's going to hear us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so so um yeah it isn't a i'm i'm sitting in my easy chair with my feet up and say god now i would like you to give me <laughs> right it's not that kind of a thing it's a it, we're living a life according to his will and in that and in that life we have this relationship where in abiding in him we're receiving what we need. Okay. Brett? 
sure I will acknowledge on that, but I have been struggling a little bit with the when I wonder if this is why he didn't end it with just eternal life in the previous paragraph. Because couldn't eternal life mean I think a lot of us think of it as sort of after our biological death, mm -hmm. but can't eternal life mean a truthful life, mm -hmm. meaning right now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In which case, uh, then he goes, gosh, eternal life. Um, and this is the boldness we have right mm -hmm. now with eternal life. Mm -hmm. is, right. that, is that okay to put it, think yeah. it that way? Yeah. Um, so um, when we look at the gospel of John, um, and, and with that kind of question in mind, it becomes pretty clear that that when Jesus talks about eternal life, he's talking about that's available to us now, right? It's not something that we have to wait for in the future. It already has begun. And why? Because eternal life, if you're to describe it biblically, it always is, it always has to do with with a relationship with God, right? And so that can begin now. That eternal life it already begins now and this is very interesting because we don't normally notice this but in verse 15 it sounds like he's saying we've already obtained the thing right so he says and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we know that we have obtained the request made of him we know we already have it and he really is talking here about eternal life that's what he's talking about to a people who are who are wondering their status and they've been called little children and they've heard over and over again if you don't love that guy then you then you don't love god and they're and and so what is our status and and um and and then they're reminded but you already have eternal life and you pray about this you pray about it god will hear you god's going to confirm that in you you already have that right god's going to confirm it in you I have a question about that. That word, that word request, it sounds like it's so businesslike, like there's no remorsefulness. Uh, there's uh -huh. no plea. There's no crying out to the Lord. It, it just seems very mm, cut and dry and impersonal to me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of formal, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm with, I'm, I'm humble. Uh, you know, I, I, because the Lord is, is so reverent and he's the all powerful and the almighty. And I feel like, um, this tiny little speck, right. That I, it's almost like, please, you know, like begging, Pleading uh -huh. versus just requesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But remember, this passage starts off with, this is the boldness we have in him. This is the boldness. And last time we talked about boldness, it was about that judgment and standing before God, knowing that we abide in Christ already. And so knowing we abide in Christ in this, bolding, in this boldness, um, then... Um, we already have obtained that which we're seeking. Um, that word request probably is kind of a, uh, it doesn't necessarily leave us feeling that kind of way, but I think that's the intent of it. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, what else do yeah. you want? Yeah, we got victory already. We have love, we have community. Yep, yeah, we got all these things. But we still got these guys who left, these people who left, right? And that's what happens next in this. So let's read verses 16 um, through 17. Okay, this gets really fun. Anybody want to read? Oh, uh, we're going to get over to Wesley over here. And then Liz, we'll have you do the end, okay? As long as I can take it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Make you walk extra. Sorry. <laughs> if anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should ask, and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I am not saying he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin 
that doesn't lead to death. You think it's a little confusing? Yeah, that's a little confusing, isn't it? Okay. So if you see your brother or sister committing a sin that is not a mortal sin, okay? So if, 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 if you see me gossiping, you can pray for me, and that's going to matter. Right? That's going to matter. But then there's a separation between, you know, seeing seeing me gossiping and you praying for me versus a, a mortal sin, a sin that is death. And that's a different thing, he says here. <clears throat> so if you kill somebody, well, the question would be, well, what is the mortal sin he's talking about? That's the question, right? Remember why he wrote the letter. The mortal sin is apostasy, right? It is, it is that false belief. It's saying Jesus wasn't fully human. It's heresy. That's what he's talking about specifically here. Okay? So, so yeah, we wouldn't necessarily want to say um, that this is that he's trying to define all sin of every kind at this particular moment. He's talking to the people who are who are in the church, right? And he's saying, he's been saying all along, little children, don't sin. I know you do. Okay? But if you see each other sinning, now he says, pray for each other. That's going to help. As for those people who have left us, don't worry about them right now. <laughs> pray pray for pray for one another okay with the um person who came to the wedding feast and didn't have the correct clothing who was cast out could this tie to that in some way yeah i think it does Huh. And the reason that I think it does is the Gospel of Matthew um, really, really focuses on what uh, what true belief really is. Um, and so it, in Matthew, we see that faith requires action, right? It requires something um, following Jesus. And, and John has been emphasizing that all along, too. It requires something. And, it, and that requires of us confession, being honest with ourselves. It requires of us pro proclaiming Christ, um, uh, believing in him. And it requires of us to want to be about, you know, what he's about, to, to love one another. Um, and you got a group of people who evidently it was both their words their testimony jesus was not human and their actions that were very hurtful that that the people there experienced and so john in response to that is reminding them that's not how we act right we're supposed to be loving um and i know you're not perfect so pray for each other that will be helpful as you are growing toward perfection, pray for one another. But, not helpful for more than but for those people, he, this is, I don't like this part. Yeah. Right. I don't like this part because it sounds like he gave up on them. Right. He's saying he's just leave them to God. Yeah. yeah. That sounds better. That sounds better. Leave them to God. It sounds better. But it does not follow. Let God sort them out. Well, no, yeah. he, I think he sort of says what you're saying. Mm -hmm. God will give life to uh, such as one. To those whose sin is not mortal. Um, okay. I, you know, there is there is sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. That doesn't mean that it's all lost 
for them. It just means don't mess around with that right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You've got cares here in our own body, right. like yep. Karen was saying. Maybe. Yep. Right. Yep. I, that that's the best I can make of this. There's still a tension there for me because it does feel like he's kind of given yeah. up on them. But but he doesn't say don't pray for them. He doesn't say that. Um, uh, remember, he's he's saying if you see your brother or sister, so you see one of us here um, who's who's gossiping, pray for them. It's going to matter in their life, okay? But don't think the same thing is going to happen for those who've left. Right? They've made their bed now. It's going to take something different for them to be restored to the to the community. Um, and what it's going to take for them is that convicting grace of God that will change their lives. So maybe that's what we pray for, for them, is that God will will correct them or convict them. Um, but, but you would not say that, that we should not pray for people outside of the church, for example. I, uh, no, that's, that's what makes me uncomfortable here is I would not say that. I think we should be praying for people who are outside the church, outside the community. It's an expression of love. Um, and so, again, the, the way I make the most sense out of this is what Karen really said, which is, well, let's focus right here, right now, right? Because we've been through a whole lot, okay? And those folks out there, um, it isn't time to try to bring them back in. So let's build ourselves up. Try to be perfected in love. Again, I say that, and there's still tension in it, right? Yeah. Okay. But remember, he's black and white. So you know, it's, yeah, it really it 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 goes in alignment with what John is trying to deliver the message. Yeah. So he's not. There's no gray area there. Mm -hmm. You know, we just have to trust God. You know, because they are His children as well. Okay, because he, he created them. He's still working with them. Absolutely. But it's not our responsibility. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so. The, the, Baby. Well, it, it reminds me in Matthew when Jesus was sending out the disciples. And he said, if, if you come to a city that doesn't receive, you shake the dust off. You know, does it mean that Jesus didn't love that those people in that city? No, but that was not the mission. Mm -hmm. Just shake the dust off, mm -hmm. go someplace else. <laughs> helpful, very helpful. Yeah, good connection, very helpful. And I and I and I do hear in this. Um, so if we go kind of slowly, in verse sixteen. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, so gossiping, for instance, at least I don't think that's a mortal sin. <laughs> you will ask, and God will give life to such a one. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So we're going to pray for each other, and it's going to make a difference in in our community and in, in our lives. Uh, to those whose sin is not mortal, there is sin that is mortal. Okay, that was that heresy. I do not say that you should pray about that. I do not say that you should pray about that. He doesn't say you shouldn't. Right. Okay, but he's not instructing them right now to do that. Okay. Um, so this is the focus right now is here. Um, kind of like what B.B. said, this, that wasn't the mission at that moment in time. Okay? So, let's wrap this up. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, verses 18 through 21. Okay, this is a wrap. <laughs> we know that... What's that? There you go. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin but he who has been born of god keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him we know that we are of god and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one and we know that the son of god has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols all together now. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Okay. So verse 
uh, 18 through 20. So kind of a summary, right? Here's some things we know, right? Um, we know that those who are born of God do not sin. Although he just said, but when you sin, pray for each other, right? And so, so the practice of sin, huh? He's just trying to help us out that way, okay? The practice of sin. Okay, John knows Christians sin, right? And he's trying to call us to a higher way of living. The, when it helps me to remember kind of that dualism where you've got, uh, we're invited into this life with Jesus and his life with Jesus is represented by light and it's, its character is holiness uh, and love, right? Um, and in this, and in abiding with Christ, there is no sin. And it says here, and he protects us from the evil one, right? Um, but there is this world under the power of the evil one. It's kind of represented by that darkness, and its character is one of death and of sin. Right? Um, and, and while we abide in Christ as little children, we don't fully abide in him yet. And that's why we keep sinning, because we don't fully abide yet. But the day will come when we will. And so he's constantly calling us to, to uh, toward that day when we will fully abide uh, in him. Um, if we were to use the language that we did from, the, from our study of Ephesians with Paul, we become a Christian and we pack our bags full of the brokenness of our lives. We take that with us, right? Um, we don't, we're not, the moment that we believe, we're not made pure, righteous, and holy. That happens over time. The way that John talks about it is with the language of abiding in Christ. And when we fully abide in him, we will not sin. So we're on that, that kind of journey. Okay? Make sense? And, mostly, yeah. And then he says, my little children, keep yourself from idols. Where does that come from? He hasn't talked about idols at all in this whole letter, right? Or has he? Isn't that kind of what he's been talking about the whole time? Yep. Yeah. Making Jesus into something different than he was. And then the life of following him becomes something very different. It kind of gives way to Gnosticism. That sense of Gnosticism was that the, uh, the spiritual realm is, is pure and the physical realm is corrupt. And the goal of life is to escape the evil, the corrupt, into what is good and pure, right? That, and uh, this docetism gives way to that kind of Gnostic way of believing. And if that's the case, then what you do on earth doesn't really matter, right? But so long as you can find the the... This, the person who knows the secret path to get out of it. It doesn't, the, the, the demand is not to fix this world or to make it a better place. It's to escape it. And so how you live your life is going to look very different than if the demand is the kingdom will come in its fullness on earth. Right? Look very, very different. So they're making Jesus into an idol where not only is he represented as something different than he was, but then what it means to follow him looks like something very different. And that's why John keeps saying, got to truly believe in him as fully human, fully divine. And you got to love like he loved. Right? Don't believe in the idol. Believe in the real thing. The real thing. Okay? That's the letter of John. I think the end kind of summed it up a little bit. So, amen? amen. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about what's following. First, um, I, it kind of breaks my heart because we got because we got to because I love this class, but I'm gone next week. I have to be in Kansas City for a continuing education event, so I won't be here next week. So we have one week off of class, and then the following week we'll be back together again, and we're going to start a new class. And I've been thinking long and hard about what I wanted to do, and I've thought. In two different ways, I thought, well, what would be good for you all? And then I thought, 
what would I like to do? And I'm afraid my selfishness is winning out. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling the good for us too. And I was thinking, I really, really want to return to the book of Acts. I have a kind of a way of thinking about it. But we've done that before, and some of you may remember that. I was trying to remember how long ago it was. Can you look it up? Okay, okay. I, I think it's been quite a while, um, even though it doesn't necessarily seem that way to me. I think it's been more than five years um, since we did it. So I'd like to return to the book of Acts. Um, and um, um, we're going to... If we think of the of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We can think of the book of Acts as the gospel of the Holy Spirit, right? So the you got the good news of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the good news of the Holy Spirit, the book of Acts. Um, and the book of Acts begins with Jesus saying, wait for the Spirit to come. It'll give you power and authority and once the Spirit comes, the book of Acts then really takes off, and, and the Holy Spirit's at work in every page of the whole thing. So I think it'll be kind of a fun study to, to remember that and focus on it. But also, 1 John was so hard to read, and Acts is so much easier to read. And I kind of like feel like that would be a good thing for us, because it's, it's narrative, and so it's just easier to read. But great things to talk about when it comes to church, community, our lives as well as this history. So, so that's okay. We'll go to the book of Acts, and but we take one week off. And Louise, did you find it? Um, you know, it, we did a lot of looking at Acts in 2016, but that might have been part of something else. That might have been a part of the Paul study? It's been a minute. It's been a minute. <laughs> no, it's been a minute. So, uh, so are we okay with that moving forward? Okay. So next week off, and then we'll be back at it. And then uh, we won't have a, 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 a week off, assuming I don't get sick or something. We won't have a week off until we get closer to Thanksgiving. So we'll be able to, uh, to keep things going. Okay. Does somebody want to pray for us as we close today? Okay, I'll pray. <laughs> um, and thank you for everybody who's here and for those of you who join us online uh, for being here. Let's pray. Loving God, we just thank you for this time uh, to be together and for one another, for the conversations we've had uh, and uh, the work that we've done. We pray your blessings upon us that, that through this time we will uh, grow all the closer to you for you are the reason we gather. And we ask your blessings upon us now as we go about the rest of our day, that we'll have our eyes fixed upon you and that we'll be faithful in all ways. Continue your great work of growing us and, um, and work through us to do good in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Join us, Jeannie. Thank you. Thank you. For three weeks. I'm going to London. All right. Have fun. Yeah, awesome. Have fun. Uh, by the time we meet.